Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today is a special episode as I'm going to spend time with our friend Ryan Quinley. You got to meet Ryan a little while ago on the podcast when we sat down with Ryan and his wife, Kayla, as they were preparing to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. They are going to focus on church planting and also theological training, and now they're in the Dominican Republic. While Ryan and Kayla were here last time, I took the opportunity to sit down and talk to Ryan about a theological topic. So today we're going to dive in to individualism. So uh, thanks, Ryan, for coming. Today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, I would say. Yeah. And well, maybe I'll just say it and then maybe I'm going to put you on the spot and have you <laughs> say sure. what we mean by it. Sure. <laughs> So I think what we're going to talk about a little bit is individualism as it relates to the church, but specifically maybe the Western church. And before we do that, could we maybe we can define those a little bit. How would you take a shot at, at those? Right. Just, I mean, you can, maybe we should kind of trace some of the roots of Western individualism and um, explain how that still shapes us today. Mm-hmm. And maybe talk about some problems that this has created and how we think about life and church, etc. But by individualism, basically just that we define ourselves as an individual as opposed to in relation to a group. Mm. And it's not maybe total or complete, but we often think of ourselves as individuals before we think of ourselves as part of a group. Mm. Right. So if you ask me, hey, talk about yourself. Mm. I might first say, well, I'm a student or a missionary. I may not say, you know, my father was so-and-so, my grandfather was so-and-so. Mm. Because I'm, I'm just not thinking in those terms. I'm thinking of me, myself, and I, mm-hmm. <laughs> not all those who I'm related to and who surround me. Mm. Why is it common, let's say, well, it's common in, wet, in the West, quote-unquote, right. but why is it common also in the Western church? Do those just sort of follow one another? Right. It's just the Western church finds itself in the West. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we think like Westerners Mm -hmm. and, um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. There's Mm -hmm. no, there's no way to get out of that completely. You can't not think like yourself and you can't not think like your culture to a certain extent. You can always be critical of it. You can always appreciate and utilize other insights from other places and other people, but the Western church is Western. And so there's no escaping that completely. And there's probably not a desire to escape that completely. Um, It's not always just a bad thing. So when we talk about individualism, though, and even like you said, hey, I'm a student, whatever, it seems like when I think about the individualism that comes from the West, so to speak, there are some good elements here, right? Like, hey, I take personal responsibility for things. And I strive to to be better, so to speak. That's sort of the most individualistic right. you can come up with. And then, of course, biblically, you're not saved by someone else's faith either. So we know there's a there's usefulness in this mentality that hey, I have to do something personally, personal faith in Christ, for example. But how might it go too far, or what what would be your thoughts on that? Right. Um... It's certainly the case that there are individualistic aspects in Scripture, Mm. right? Scripture never eliminates the individual. Mm -hmm. There are certain philosophies or certain theologies even that would eliminate the individual. Mm. It's all group. It's all one. And there is no individual. And that would be an overcorrection to go Mm. there because we do appreciate uh, the individual and, you know, myself as a Baptist, the individual's faith and not being... Uh, you know, baptized as a baby, but baptized when mm-hmm. I myself have faith, you know. So um, thinking about individuals and thinking individualistically is not bad. It's when individualism um, detracts from other truths mm-hmm. and biblical truth and understanding certain parts of Scripture and, and life in the church that maybe we need to take a step back and um, bring in some critique that mm-hmm. other people might offer to us. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a good time to dive in. What, which ones would you come up with sort of ex- from an example perspective that maybe people could, we could use as an example that people might go, oh yeah, that is how I think about that in the church. Sure. So, I mean, let's, let's just go back a couple hundred years first. Um, you could go back farther. You could go back to the Reformation. You could go towards the, you know, the uh, breakdown of Aristotelian thought. Um, and all of that is kind of the stream that starts 
Western individualism. But one of the thinkers that uh, people often point to is Rene Descartes, um, thinking, writing in the early 1600s. And he got by himself and he said, I'm not going to think about anything else besides what I myself can think of in my own mind. And he eventually grounded his entire philosophy on that. He mm. says, I think, therefore I am. Mm. First, he said, I doubt, therefore I am. And so he understood that he was a thinking thing. Mm. And that's how he defined himself, a thinking thing. And based on that, tried to define or give proof for God. Um, he did not know for certain that other individuals existed. He only knew that he himself existed until he could finally get there logically, you know, rationally. Mm. After the first step, the foundation of him understanding that he himself is a thinking thing. <laughs> and so that, I mean, this, along with other um, philosophical factors, are just this is where Western individualism mm -hmm. comes from. So if we approach things in that mindset that me, myself, and my own mind defines truth. I know truth based on my own thinking thoughts, not based on anything else outside of that. I have to doubt everything except what I think by myself. Mm. Uh, this maybe isn't so helpful mm. and perhaps not so accurate. <laughs> and so there's certain things in the church that we see we kind of think that way, not just like Descartes did, uh, because it's been a couple hundred years since then, but we still have that individualistic tendency. So thinking like singing, in the mm -hmm. church services. It's just me and God. You know, when Colossians says, sing to one another, mm. teach one another in songs, hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, I challenged someone one time, find a modern song that teaches one another, mm. that you sing to one another. And he couldn't. He couldn't think of one. He's a music leader guy. and He couldn't think of a single one that he sings that is us singing to one another to instruct one another in the faith. Because it's all just me and my relationship with God mm. in the song. And not that that's all bad by any means, but if that's all we have, we're, we're coming short there. Um, yeah, when I think about, it's funny you bring up the singing and the, the worship songs that we hear today. Yeah, just reflecting now, almost all of them are about who I am. And yeah, maybe in, hopefully in relationship to God, but right. who I am right. and, and what that means, you know. So yeah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. yeah, and you think of the Lord's Supper, for example. Um, this is, by biblical definition, a corporate event. It's supposed to celebrate us in Christ and talk about his promise to the church and our declaration of him as one body and one loaf and one cup. It's all about unity. But when we take it, you know, we sit by ourselves and contemplate our own individual sins against God and our own little hearts. <laughs> and um, We don't think about our neighbor sitting next to us even. There's no unity. There's mm. no corporate element. We just think of it individualistically. Mm. And this is a misunderstanding of what the Lord's Supper is. It's an, a supper, you know, gathering around mm. together as one body. It's a very corporate event that we treat very individualistically because mm. we just have this very individualistic mindset. We, yeah. I'm thinking now, and maybe, I don't know if you have a thought on this, that when I think about the, so now going into Old Testament, New Testament, when I think about the Jews and their traditions where they celebrated in the Old Testament, they were always these group gatherings, yeah. right? If you were, yeah. if it was Passover or if it was just the Sabbath itself, like just these were so, they were social, they right. weren't. They weren't about this individualism, I guess. Right. So, just thinking about that now too. Right. There's a people, and the people are celebrating, and the people are in relationship to God. Mm. Same as the church. That's the church that's in relationship to God. Not that they could never think of individuals within the church. They weren't eliminating the individual, but they thought of themselves corporately. Mm. And I don't know if we'd ever be able to think of ourselves as corporately as they did right. because of our individualism, but we could certainly appropriate <laughs> some of that mm. and think through some of that for our own practices in the church. Mm. Yeah, no, that's good. Is there some practical things maybe we can do as Christians, even because we are all, most of us, I guess, when we're in a church service singing, is there some mindset shifts maybe we can have like while we're doing these worship sessions, let's say? Yeah, some of it can be your mindset changing. Um, I used to think, you know, uh, that Christians may be satisfied if everyone in the, the church had a cubicle to sit in. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to see anyone else. No one else's kid could distract you from being in the mm -hmm. zone, you know, worshiping just you and, your, you and God. 
And not thinking of it like that Mm -hmm. would be a helpful start. Thinking of it, hey, this is my family that I'm here with. These are my brothers and sisters, and we're here together for a reason. I'm not just at home sitting watching this on TV by myself. We might be with COVID right now, but this is a problem normally if we think of it normally like this. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to teach middle school Bible, and the students in the class had trouble thinking of any reason why they actually needed to go to church because they could do it from their homes. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a major problem in our mindset. This is not what church is. Think of all the one another commands in Scripture. Mm -hmm. One another this, one another that, and do this to one another, do that to one another, Mm -hmm. all over the place. I mean, you have to Google them to find them all. Mm -hmm. You can't do that sitting at home. The church is a body and it's supposed to function like a family. I can 100% relate to the idea of being in church and being almost wor- worried that I might distract or be distracted either way. Right. And I, and I, and this is where I think I maybe overstretched an idea. The idea being I should be reverent to God. I should be sensitive to what he might be wanting to tell me. But I almost, yeah, I had this like box mentality, like don't be distracted by anything right. <laughs> right. else. Oh, some kids screaming. Make sure that kid gets quiet. Right. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> right. This is that was the first thing that came on. Not yeah. that that's pretty awesome that we've got this little one that that's also part of our church body. So I can hundred percent right. relate to that. Right. And it's not the case that you know no one likes sitting at a dinner table with a kid who's just out of control. Yeah. Right. So it's not suggesting that we just need to anything goes <laughs> yeah. in the worship services because you know we're a family after all. That wouldn't be a good family. Right. <laughs> but. Uh, we do need to think of it more corporately. Hmm. Yeah, this um, idea, and you you mentioned it briefly, but I think it's just it's all such a perfect picture, and there's and it gets expanded later too. But being the body, mm-hmm. and that we're all parts of the body, <laughs> and right. different parts too. So that there's this interesting piece that the parts of the body are individualistic, <laughs> right? But are not viable outside of the body. Right. And I think it's a, it's such a great analogy for us to think about. Like, you know, my nose isn't very useful if it's on the ground. <laughs> you know? Right. It's part of the body and it's actually better when the rest of the body is better. Um, so if you want to bring that in too, and the rest of the right. body is better <laughs> if that part's right. better. So it's just an cr- incredible analogy for us to think about, I guess. But maybe back to your point about don't get overly oriented one way or the other perhaps right and i mean to the analogy it's the biblical one and paul talks about we need each other in the body um Mm. especially thinking of like ephesians 4 god's gifted teachers to the church we need teachers you know a lot of people think that um the best way and the most understandable way to read the bible is to get alone read it really quickly and then understand what it means to me And this is quite problematic in in our churches that we have everyone without much guidance, without much help, without much um, any attention paid to a teacher, someone to help us understand what we're reading. We just think we've grasped it instantly. Mm -hmm. I just read the text and boom, there it is for me. And I've got my meaning from it and I'm good to go and I pray and go go about my day. And this, this type of Bible reading really is secondary to the Bible reading in, in the church. Mm. We're reading it publicly, and it's being proclaimed and explained by a pastor teacher. Mm. Right? And we're, we're learning from the teachers, and we're going deeper, and we're understanding it. Mm. Not just saying, okay, I think this means to me. I mean, everyone's been part of a Bible study where you just go around the room. Everyone reads a passage, and you say, okay, what does it mean to you? Oh, that's really great. Well, what does it mean to you? Oh, that's really cool, too. Yeah. You know, and it's just something different. It means all kinds of things. Yeah. You know, this is not, maybe not so helpful. Mm. Uh, it's excellent to read our Bibles on our own, and we should absolutely do that. But we need to make sure we're not um, being too individualistic about that. Mm. And especially when we have so many resources available to us. There's so many great teachers and they've written them, <laughs> written their insights down. Hmm. And um, those who write books don't just do it for fun. They're gifts to the body. Hmm. They've been gifted as teachers, and hmm. they're writing this down for us to understand. And not everyone has to read all the books. Hmm. But we have so many resources that we could really improve our individual Bible reading time hmm. by taking some time to learn from from others in that as well. How, how do... I, 
as you were talking about that, I was thinking th- both that that makes a ton of sense. In other words, you know, the whole standing on shoulders of giants, so to speak. Like, there are people that have come before us that have right. written some things down and whatever. But how do you cut through, you know, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak? How, how do people find who, sh- where should they be listening to? Or at least how do you we get in sort of the right framing so that we know what is true and trustworthy and and how to, how to do that. Any thoughts for people? Yeah, and this is just where um, the importance of a church comes in. In a church, and a church being led well by a pastor, pastors or elders or whatever you have in your church um, to be guided and, and shown. Because not everyone can just figure this out really quickly. Mm-hmm. Like if I pick some other topic, I don't know, like, uh, weight loss or something and just searched on Amazon for some book, I may find something horrible, you know, yeah. I have no idea. But if I kind of have um, a way that's been already lit up mm. by a pastor or a teacher, you know, and to follow the analogy, a weight loss coach, you know, mm. here's some authors I really recommend or something about that topic that you're interested in, mm. um, then that'd be helpful. And there's a way to start thinking about the Bible, to think about theology that you just keep in mind as you're reading. Mm. So, for example, if someone's already explained the doctrine of the Trinity to you and you read the New Testament and you already think, okay, I I know this is true. I believe the doctrine of the Trinity. You can start to see it in the text as you read by yourself. Mm -hmm. Not every individual Christian has to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity uh, by himself. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that is the church understands and the church gives to the church as, as understanding and as doctrine. Mm. And then the people in the church read scripture in light of that, in light of the doctrine of the Trinity. And that goes for many other doctrines as well. Yeah. This reminded me of something I was reading about individualism. And one of the dangers was when you go so deep into the individualism, it, it reminded me of Descartes, who you mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. that it basically can take you down a path where I have to discover everything as if right. I am the first person to walk on this land and have to figure out what right. this discovery or the first right. person to sail a ship and I'm the first and I got to go figure out how to navigate through the ocean. It's almost like you go you can get down in that path and in fact this article I was reading was maybe let's say drawing a bit of a correlation between that phenomenon and today's phenomenon that People are trying to blur the lines of religious denominations is that kind of what they mm-hmm. use, but just where is your grounding? It was almost like, well, whatever you feel about the situation or whatever you feel right. about God is um, is what you should believe. And then, oh, by the way, because you're individualistic, you shouldn't challenge anybody else on their right. views because that's their own thing. Right. And so there's this – it's almost like a vicious cycle, I would say, that you can get into. Right. And there's different streams of – philosophy and religious thought that's come down to produce these different areas of emphasis. But yeah, you have certain people and I, I tend to be more like the first, like, okay, I need to figure everything out. Mm. (laughs) I better make sure I understand everything and realizing, no, I can't do that. I need to rely on other people. Mm. No one can know everything. Mm -hmm. That should be very obvious to us. I've got to rely on other people. And so I better make sure I'm relying on people that I trust and that I think are faithful to the Lord and faithful to his word. And then the other side of things where you have, yeah, just like we are talking about the Bible study, you know, your truth that you get from every single passage of scripture is something just for you that no one else would have found. This is another danger um, of thinking individualistically just in another mindset. Yeah. Yeah. um, Yeah. It's, it's fascinating because it's sort of obvious that you can't know everything, right? Like, do you know how this the screen of your laptop works? Well, maybe sort of, but like right. <laughs> you couldn't recreate it right. if given all the tools, you right. still couldn't recreate it. So you there's some grounding that you're using, um, and I think the same is true in any endeavor. So it certainly is true also in our being the body of Christ in relationship to Christ. It, it's certainly true there. The trick being, it's a very practical thing here. Then is what people should maybe strive to know is how to be discerning. How to be discerning about what they're hearing and who they're hearing from. So I think that's right. that's an opportunity as well. Like, who do you trust, like you said? Right. Right. Well, 
Well, one one way to kind of think through this practically and doctrinally, as we've been doing, is to think about when we what we mean when we say the word salvation. Mm. Right, when I say salvation, many people in the church, in our American Western context, think, right, that time when I said the sinner's prayer or something and I was saved, and end of story. Right, and that's fine and true and good, um, but that's a limited picture mm. of what we see in Scripture, of what salvation means. Uh, salvation, of course, no one means that it just involves me. But oftentimes that's where we're looking is just how it affects me, how it, evol- it involves me. And we're not looking at, say, the, the big picture of salvation, how it started and where it's going and how we're all involved and what all that means from even from you know, Genesis to Revelation, the, the meta narrative, the big storyline of Scripture. It's a lot of things there that we, we would miss. I mean, you think about the Psalms and David as he's speaking and how this is pointing forward to Christ and the way he picks this up and takes it as the king, the Messiah. And we miss all these details in scripture sometimes because we just read it for, oh yeah, I'm like David, I, I, think, of, I think like this too. I think about God and I'm saved and God saves me and that's really nice. And that's true and that's fine to think it like that, but uh, we, we miss sometimes these big pushes and signs in scripture saying, hey, <laughs> look at this salvation that God's bringing the world, mm-hmm. you know, and look at where this is heading. Look at where history is heading, the new heavens and the new earth. And mm-hmm. we miss that because we just think here and right now with only me involved mm-hmm. when we think of the word salvation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe you can also kind of get into more of a me versus the world in some ways mm-hmm. is another way that that manifests, right? That, yeah. You can you can kind of say, well, hey, um, if it's about my own salvation, but look at all the pressures outside of me that are, mm-hmm. you know, happening in society <laughs> that that I don't like, so to speak, right. versus the bigger picture of what God's doing. Right. We know the ending of the book. Let's put right. it that way, right? Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, One quote I want to read from C.S. Lewis, it's in Mere Christianity. He talks about this idea of individualist being individualist or uh, maybe collectivism would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this. I'll just read it real quick. I think it's an an interesting uh, maybe ending for us. The idea that the whole human race is in a sense one thing, one huge organism like a tree, must not be confused with the idea that individual differences do not matter or that real people are somehow less important than the collective things, like classes, races, and so on. Christianity thinks of human individuals not as mere members of a group or items on a list, but as organs in a body, different from one another, and each contributing what no one, other, what no one else could. When you find yourself wanting to turn your children, your pu- or pupils, or even your neighbors into people exactly like yourself, remember that God probably never meant that to happen. You and they are different organs intended to do different things. On the other hand, when you are tempted to not bother about someone else's troubles because they are no business of yours, remember that though he is different from you, he is in part of the he is part of the same organism as you. If you forget that he belongs to the same organism as yourself, you will become an individualist. If you forget that he is a different organ from you, if you want to suppress differences and make all people all alike, you will become a totalitarian or collectivist. But Christian, but a Christian must not either take a totalitarian or individualist. I feel a strong desire to tell you, and I expect you feel a strong desire to tell me, which of these two errors is worse. That's the devil getting at us. He always sends errors into the world in pairs, pairs of opposites. And he always encourages us to spend a lot of time thinking, which is worse. You can see why, of course. He relies on your extra dislike of one error to the draw of you gradually into the opposite one but do not let us be fooled we have to keep our eyes on the goal and go straight through between both errors we have no other concern than with either of them and i like the way he illustrates the organisms of the body i think it hits kind of what you were saying earlier if you can get into like hey my faith is mine by the way it's private and it's what i feel about it and i don't care what you do anyway you're separate from me. You're not part of me. Right. That's the, that's I would say individualism, especially in Christianity, that gets really dangerous. Right. Yeah. And our, 
our pride gets in the way too. Think of Second Timothy three sixteen. All scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for one of the things is rebuking. <laughs> yeah. Rebuking one another. I mean, no one rebukes anyone in yeah. in the modern Western church and we probably need to be rebuked more often, yeah. you know. But this is no, I'm my own person. Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to tell me how to think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and this is problematic when we think in this hyper individualistic sense and there's other reasons why we think like that. Uh as far as the self-autonomy mm-hmm. goes, and I'm my own person, so don't tell me what to think or do. Yep. There's other reasons besides just you know the word individualism to explain this, yeah. um, how we are. But the point is that we often think individualistically like that, mm-hmm. and I'm not my own person if I'm in the church. Right. I'm under God's authority and in a family that's supposed to train me and correct me and rebuke me, mm-hmm. and pastors are supposed to do that not lording it over people, not abusively, but they're supposed to, in love, shepherd the flock that God has entrusted to them. We have a lot of trouble with that because we think I'm my own person walking into church to sing my own songs, (laughs) to take my own Lord's Supper, and to leave and not to have to worry about anyone telling me really what to do. Yeah. And it's a problematic way to look at look at the church. I'm I'm reminded of a scripture and keep me honest if you're uh, about this. I think it's James because we just did the study on it and he says if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault, you know. So yeah. that's it's and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but it's basically if your brother so there's sort of an indication that it's someone in the body of Christ. Sure. Go and tell him his fault, you know? And whenever we talked about this in my group study, it was a men's group, the men were like, oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> telling someone else they're wrong about, you know, yeah. that, that, what? Like, why would yeah. I? But what if I, I mean, I might be wrong the next day, so why would I, you know, am I right. hypocritical? That's kind of like the idea, right. I think, that came through. But the reality is this accountability, right? this making the body better, right? We want our body to be um, striving, right? Maybe back to the organism analogy. If you're eating a bunch of bad stuff, but you're still running outside, right. like you're not, this is, you're in conflict, so to speak. Right. Yeah. I had a friend once who, um, we kind of did this for each other. You know, we'd ask each other hard questions about life or, you know, whatever, uh, just to keep each other accountable. And I came to him one time to ask him a, a semi hard question about something I had just seen. And, Honestly, it was not a huge deal. I mean, great guy, was not like a major sin issue or anything, but I thought he would want me to ask him mm. about this if I picked up on this pattern mm. in his life. And I was so nervous. I could barely, you know, mm. sit still. My arms were shaking. And he picked up on that, which made it all the, all the worse. You know, and he said, look, man, I can tell you're extremely uncomfortable. And I was like, shoot. <laughs> 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 I couldn't hide it. And he goes, thank you for doing it anyway. And yeah. uh, he really appreciated that. And he's done the same for me in my life. And uh, as hard as that is, we need to be doing stuff like that. Mm. We need to not just think individualistically. Mm. Um, and as I said earlier, we're never going to become collectivists mm. in our mindset. I mm. mean, in, in, in an extreme sense. Mm. So just, it'd be hard for me to even think like that. Mm. But we certainly could appropriate some things that family-oriented, group-oriented mm. people would do. Yeah. And apply them to our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Good. Well, thanks, Ryan, for the discussion. Appreciate yeah. this. This was great. Um, and it feels like we we opened a lot more doors we could talk about again. Right. And maybe we will. So yeah. appreciate you coming in. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thanks.